Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Steve Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, and uh, it's good to be back here in the uh, studio again where we can record and uh, bring some very insightful broadcasts for you guys. And we appreciate your patience with us there. We were traveling there, uh, had to go take care of uh, some uh, things with my my dad and so we were out of town there for well, i guess about a week there we we're trying to do just some quick takes of the broadcast and um so anyway we're, we're trusting that this will be a blessing for you tonight and of course the first night back here on israeli news live there's something i'm going to get into that uh, although there has been a lot of news about president trump and uh, and a lot of the Zionist leaders in Israel likening him uh, into a connection to King David uh, and, and also in the past how they have said about Benjamin Netanyahu that he was uh, the king of Israel or the king of the Jews title that he actually was uh, given when he first ran and became the prime minister of Israel uh, many many years ago it's been now and of course as some would believe was prophesied by mike evans that he would actually be uh, prime minister not once but twice over israel uh, and i used to really believe that in the beginning especially when i was more pro-zionist uh, views now i do want to clarify i do believe in the right of the jewish people my own people to be able to return to the homeland in the middle east uh, but I am not supportive of throwing out everybody in the Middle East in order to do so. But I believe it is a biblical uh, fact that our people would return back to the homeland, regardless of different views on that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is considered to be the king of the Jews. And as I mentioned, Mike Evans, even in his own uh, statement here, when he meets Menachem Begin, who was the prime minister at the time, uh, gives this elaborate story where he meets Benjamin Netanyahu in a very uh, kind of odd sort of way and uh, at the death of his brother and uh, and he goes to his house uh, supposedly unknown to the uh, uh, Netanyahu family and anoints him with oil and says that he would be prime minister not once but twice over Israel uh, I cannot help but think, though, now, in hindsight, seeing things that I have seen uh, come about, that truly the scripture of Daniel's prophecy 11, chapter 11, I think it's verse 14, the violent, the, son, the, the angel Gabriel is speaking directly to Daniel, and he says the violent, the sons of the, let's see, how, let, me, let me just pull that up. I don't want to misquote that. And I've got some amazing passages to share with you, but let's just pull it up. The sons of the violent among your people, I believe, is exactly how it's worded. The sons of the violent among your people, uh, they will try, not Obadiah, but they will try to uh, establish the vision, but they shall fall. And I know that according to uh, Rambam and in the, uh, in the writings that, that he has done, that they believe that Yeshua and, of course, the apostles are actually the fulfillment of this prophecy that Yeshua was and his apostles were the violent among, uh, according to Daniel's prophecy there, and that they're the ones that brought about the demise of the state of Israel. Uh, well, that's totally erroneous, completely false. It's not true uh, that they did not bring about the demise of the state of Israel. Uh, back in the ancient days, I should say, or the, or the, or the house of Judah. It says, Okay, and they will, and the violent among thy people shall lift themselves up to establish the vision. Or, Nasu, you could say, marry the vision. And that is to bring about both, in their minds, the house of Israel, which would be Roman Catholicism, uh, as the so-called Christianity or the Christian Zionism of today and that of Judaism. And this is going to end up much bigger than I ever even imagined it. I used to really think Rome was the big, big bad boogeyman, but it's actually a combination of Rome, uniting together Rome, and of course the Zionist movement, not 
biblical Zionism where you would bring back Jewish people that are longing to see the coming of the Messiah, but rather those renegades, as Daniel was told about the angel Gabriel, that would come in and try to marry this vision. Uh, it is just like it was in biblical times 2,000 years ago. Rome and the house of Judah have once again married together. Now, oddly enough, if you know anything about Mike Evans and you've ever seen some of the pictures there with Mike, uh, and I'll include the link into this for you, but uh, Mike Evans, because he talks about it on this link right here, uh, 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 about this anointing of Benjamin Netanyahu. But I was really troubled when I began to see the images uh, such as what we have right here on the screen for you now. Uh, Mike Evans, he's with Shimon Perez, who betrayed the Jewish people and sold out the Jewish people in order to bring about this Nostri Atate. Uh, he was actually the, the, the one that helped bring it about. It was the Jewish Congress that ended up signing it with the Vatican, and they basically married Israel and uh, the, the Jewish people together, and of course Pope Francis there. So it lets me know that he clearly is a Jesuit, and he was working for Rome from the very beginning. But yes, he worked with Menachem Begin as well, and I used to think Menachem Begin was probably the only decent prime minister, only to realize there's a lot more sinister activities in the background. But really there's more, a deeper issue that I wanted to share with you guys, and that is something that was really heavy on my heart was Netanyahu's name. Benjamin Netanyahu, and I've always known because it's a Hebrew name, Netanyahu is a gift of our God. Okay, Natan, gift, Yah being God, or from the word Yehovah, and uh, the U at the end would be our. So he is like, his name was uh, given as a gift of our God. And I used to think years ago when I was more supportive of prime, the prime minister that, wow, what a wonderful thing. But as many of you that may know, his name was not always Netanyahu. Uh, of course, you, this here is on a uh, site called Quora, but it's easy to look up anywhere. His grandfather that came over was a Polish man. Uh, Milikowski is their actual last name, a Polish immigrant uh, from, uh, from Poland. And he began to write in the papers there, and he used the name Netanyahu. Uh, is his pen name. Well, Benzion, his, Netanyahu's father, adopts the name uh, Netanyahu instead of Melikowski because that's what everyone did there. And, of course, they become uh, Netanyahu. So he gets this name acquired later. So it's not like it's already the wonderful biblical name. But there was a reason, though. God was dealing with me about this issue uh, like I said, while I was gone on this trip here, and I even said to my wife and even my daughter, help me to remember a gift of God. Because a gift of our God is not Prime Minister Netanyahu, and no, it's not President Trump. And let's just say for argument's sake, both men mean well. And I'm sure that Prime Minister Netanyahu feels like that he's doing the right thing. He feels like he is really doing something to help the Israeli people. Uh, and to bring about biblical prophecy, because clearly the scripture says that the violent among your people, in other words, those that are willing to do wars, are those that are there to bring about, they're there to, to, to try to marry this vision. And of course, the vision is Daniel's vision uh, of 927, which is the bringing about the prince that shall come. Now, the prince that shall come uh, is the Antichrist. But the prince, the Mashiach, Nagid, okay, that is the, that is the anointed prince, he would actually be cut off. And we need to keep that in mind, especially my Jewish friends that are listening. And let me just, maybe I should pull that one up as well, because this is very vital that we understand what is that vision that they're trying to establish. It is Daniel chapter 9 and we go down i think it's around verse 24 25 26 27 those verses right there all right and uh let's see know therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore and build jerusalem until the one anointed a prince nagit okay see ad mashiach nagit the anointed prince shall be seven weeks and for three score and two weeks it shall be built again with a broad place in a moat, but in troublous times. 
And after three score and two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off. All right, as plain as day. Okay, ikat the Mashiach ve'en lo. Okay, and so the Messiah, will, he will be cut off and he will be no more. That's exactly what it says in Hebrew. All right. For the, as far as the physical flesh of the Messiah would be cut off and would be no more. Now, oddly enough, Yeshua, when he reads out of Isaiah, Yeshayahu 61, Isaiah 61, he reads verse 1 and half of verse 2. He closes the scroll and says, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He doesn't read about the deliverance of Israel in the bringing about the peace and the restoration of Israel. He only brings about that first part and of course the judgment which would be against those evil ones of that day all right so it's perfectly in line but then it goes on to say all right and the people of a prince okay sh that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary all right now see in the mashiach he's already the lo. he is no more Vehair Veha Kodesh Ishahit Am Nagid Haba. All right, so the prince is going to come, but he's not a Mashiach. He's not an anointed prince. He's just a prince that shall come. All right, he will destroy the temple and the sanctuary, as it says at the beginning of the sentence right there in Hebrew. Well, Titus, the Roman general, the prince of Rome, so to speak. And we, you know how you know he's a prince? See, Titus was a prince as well. His father went back and became the leader of Rome. But it's actually speaking of this prince that shall come. See, Haba, the coming, which is a future prince. But again, he's not a Mashiach. He's not anointed. That's the Antichrist. And he shall make a firm covenant with many for one week, and for half of a week he shall cause the sacrifice and offering to cease. All right, now, we see that, but where do I want to go with this, so guys? The point is, I go back to Netanyahu and his name. Melikowski was his actual real name, right? But Netanyahu, a gift of our God, now, in my opinion, the true gift of our God is Yeshua. As he says, and I'll come back to this in just a few minutes, this is in the book of John, the, the, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 4, verse 10. Yeshua answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. Now, hold that thought right there. So, the real gift of God, the true Netanyahu, is Yeshua. Yeshua is Netanyahu, not Benjamin Netanyahu. You understand? But isn't it ironic, though? Yeshua tells the woman at the well, she comes there, he asks her for a drink. And she says, sir, there is no dealings between you and I. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We have no dealings with one another. And uh, she says, and you have nothing to draw with. Why do you even ask me? I'm just paraphrasing it. And Yeshua says to her, if you knew it was the gift of God and who it is that say, uh, uh, says to you, give to me a drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. But you know what's interesting and what really blows my mind away is that the evangelical community, people whom I love, the Hebrew Roots community, the Messianic community, especially the, the, these groups here, you have taken and you have sold out Yeshua, the true gift of God, and you've taken on a false gift. A gift that is only given in title. And isn't it ironic that if we look also at the Prime Minister here, what is he trying to do? Check a look at some of these videos here. Benjamin Netanyahu, gift to the prime, uh, PM of Modi, a mass, uh, a, a special gift, a Jeep, 
that produces or converts salt water into water. See, it's reported to have given uh, the PM Modi a, a, a water purification vehicle can produce high quality drinking water. Okay, 20,000 liters in the sea of seawater in a day. 20,000 liters. This little tiny truck here. Just take it down there and pump all the water you want with it, right? Now, I find it kind of interesting. And then you have also, and it's not just there. Watch, watch what the Prime Minister says here. I want to share this one with you guys because I think this one is important. He's at APAC, right? APEC is the Jewish organization that lobbies uh, Congress. And if you know anything about APEC, uh, this could be a little disturbing for you if you really knew the truth behind some of these things. Let's see if I get the volume here to work right. Well, it was working, but no, it doesn't want to work. Let's see if we can just play it anyway. What it does for water, what it does for the environment. So when you take these two things, agriculture and water, and the other technologies that we apply in both, we can change the world. We are. We are. I just heard about an African woman in Africa has to walk eight hours a day to give water to her children. Four hours one way to a well, four hours back. And a young Israeli company brought in this technology that improves on Moses. Remember Moses? He brought water from a rock. They bring water from thin air. They bring water to Africa, to millions of people in Africa. Israeli technology. Now, I will say that is a good thing. And I appreciate this. And I appreciate the Israeli technology that can actually help bring water. But see, that's a natural water. And what's interesting, though, it's not always that free gift. Yeshua says, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask him. Notice, just ask. Just speak to him. And he'd give you water that you don't have to come to the well no more. Like the woman in Africa, so she don't have to go to the well. But notice, the gift of God, Netanyahu, Though it is a noble thing that Israel is doing for the people of Africa, but sometimes that gift of water comes at a price. Let me make that point clear to you in this video here. Today I'm going to make an unprecedented offer to Iran. It relates to water. The Iranian people are victims of a cruel and tyrannical regime that denies them vital water. Israel stands with the people of Iran, and that is why I want to help save countless Iranian lives. Here's how. Iran's meteorological organization says that nearly 96% of Iran suffers from some levels of drought. Issa Kalantari, a former Iranian agriculture minister, said that 15 million Iranians could be forced out of their homes due to environmental damage. 50 million. Millions of Iranian children are suffering due to mismanagement, to incompetence, and the theft of vital resources by the Iranian regime. Now, Israel also has water challenges. We've developed... So, the, the end of the day, what this comes down to, get rid of the regime, will help you with your water problems. Where's the gift? Where is it just, like it is with Yeshua, just ask, just speak, and I'll give you water. I'll give you water that you don't have to come to the well. But in this case here, it's a trade-off. But you know what would be interesting? Do you realize if the Prime Minister would take the position he has, and he would call up Mr. Zarif on the telephone, or Mr. Rahani, and say, you know, look, we've had some troubles over the years. And I know that your people are suffering. I want to show, I want to give you that olive branch of love. I want to give your country the technology to be able to help your people have clean drinking water. If the Prime Minister would be truly like the Mashiach is, and he would take to the Palestinian people who instead are getting contaminated water, 
that causes them dysentery and every other kind of disease and would be like Yeshua and just say, ask, and I will give you the water, the clean water that the Israelis have been able to do the technology of. Maybe it would change the way the people feel towards our people in Israel. Maybe we could forge some love and relationship with the other peoples that are in the Middle East. If God has gifted us this type of technology, why can't we use it for good? Why can't we use it to build relationships of love? Why can't we be like Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah that was there 2,000 years ago that was willing to do it for free. Now, I want to show you something. It's fascinating because this is what was on my heart. Netanyahu, a gift of God. And then, of course, as I see with Yeshua, he was to give water of life. And think about it. In Exodus, here, we're in chapter, uh, I believe it's, uh, yeah, chapter 2, I believe it is. And the child grew. Remember, Moshe, Moses, was put into that basket. As I said to you, the basket, basket that he was put into, it was daubed with mud. It represented the womb of a woman placed in the water like the birth of a child. And when Pharaoh's daughter came down there and he, she saw that basket and sent her maidens out to see what it was in the reeds right there. There it was in the reeds, the reeds representing the people in the midst of the people, pulls it out, sees a child. And she gives him the name Moshe. And I'll read to you exactly why. I'll read to you first in Hebrew. Ve'yahi lach lebein. Okay, and it was to her uh, for a son. And she called his name Moses. See, Mashetihu. That's right where the word comes from, but in Arabic, which is Musa. Because she drew him from the water. Moses was drawn from the water. Right? And it's interesting. Everything about his life was about the water, right? And even Netanyahu quotes Moses. He brought it from the rock, right? Well, think about it, Prime Minister. Think about it. I'm sure you know about Israeli news live. Maybe not like it, but I'm trying to help you, my brother. Listen. Now, let's take again. We'll go over here. I believe it's chapter 7. All right, in the book of Exodus, Shemot, it's actually the book of names, is what it's called in Hebrew. Verse 19, And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over their streams, over their pools, over their ponds of water, that they may become blood, that there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Yes, so Moses had the ability to use the water as a weapon as well. But the time of the Mashiach, the days of using it as a weapon, was past. All right? Again, what do we have? And the Lord, this is in Exodus 14, just before he comes out and sings about the great victory. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward and lift up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it. So Moses was drawn for the water. Moses could take and strike the water and turn it to blood. Moses could take and put his rod and speak to the water and the water would part from side to side. And then what happened? In Exodus, Shemot 17, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin by their stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and encamped in Rephaim. Remember the Rephaim, the giants? Hmm. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people strove with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why strive ye with me? Wherefore did you try the Lord? The people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore hast thou brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord and to Yehovah, Beitzak Moshe el Yehovah le mor ma ase la am haze. See, what shall I do with, uh, unto this people? They are almost ready to stone me. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Pass on before the people and take with thee of the... Notice this, Prime Minister. Take with you the, before the people and take with you the elders of Israel and your, thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, and take in thy hand and go. Behold, I will stand before you there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, in the name of the place called Massah and Mirabah, because of the striving of the children of Israel. And that's what happened 1,500 years later. When the Mashiach came out, not a future Mashiach, the real Mashiach came out. The one that was to be cut off according to Daniel's prophecy. And he come out. And what happened with him? You took the elders of Israel. They came out. The Roman soldiers as well came out. Some of Esau's children. And they smote him with the rod. And said prophesy. Tell us who hit you. But the elders of Israel came out to judge the rock. And they smote the rock, and it brought forth the water. And when Yeshua was smitten, and the Roman soldier pierced his side, when the scripture clearly identifies it in Zechariah 12, they will look upon him whom they have thrust through. It's not the piercing of his hands, per se, but the spear that went to his side and pierced actually on the side where his heart is under that fifth rib there and the blood came out which was what? It was a beautiful type. What kind of type was this? Like it was when, when Adam was laid down in the garden and God taken from Adam, he put him into a deep sleep. He opened up his side. He taken a rib from him right there, the closest one to his heart, and he made Eve the woman. Do you remember, and I'll just remind you of this in the Hebrew language, uh, yet another scripture that I think is worthy to go to, uh, Bereshit. And I believe it's chapter 1, in fact. When we go down in here, and let's see here. It's when God is going to make... Oh no, it's actually chapter 2. I remember now. The first chapter. He created them, male and female. They were in one together. In chapter 1. But in chapter 2, there comes that separation. Alright? Beautiful story. Yeshua redeemed... Do you not realize that the fall came once... Adam and Eve, they, when they were one, there was nothing that could separate them. They were one in Christ, so to speak. One in the Mashiach. One in the Anointed. One in Yahuwah. Once they were separated, then Eve wandered over here. Satan tempted her. She was deceived. She didn't willfully sin. Adam, he knew better, and he willfully sinned. They both fail. And so there would have to come a redemption. But here's what's fascinating. All right? Now, let me find where God actually... Let's get to this one part here. It's just a beautiful story here. All right? Now... And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with the flesh instead thereof. See, that's what I was talking about. But let me go. i got to back up just a little bit. It's where God creates him when he makes him of a dust. And oh my, don't you realize? Oh, there's so much I could go with on this. Hang on. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm excited here. Maybe I think it's verse 9. Let's see here. Okay, uh, and uh, oh, here we here we go. Verse seven. Then the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground. See, and it says, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. I just love to read this in in Hebrew here. See, he a fad min haadam. All right, he formed man from the earth, from Adama, from Adama. Then he says, He breathes. 
into his nostrils. Breathe into his nostrils. Chaim. Don't you realize that that Chaim is the very life of Almighty God? Do you not realize that in the midst of the garden there were two trees? One, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was Eitz Yada Vera'a. Then there was the tree of life, Eitz Chaim. What was they, what did they receive when he breathed in their nostrils? Chaim. What is a tree known by? Yeshua said, by its fruit you shall know them. And if they had the Chaim breathed into them, because remember in chapter one, they are both, they're one. All right. So what happens here? He breathes into their nostrils, that breath of life. Chaim in a plural form. So we know who's doing the breathing. It's the tree of life. And the tree of life stood there after his resurrection. He breathed on his apostles and he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. He was showing that he was the same God in the Garden of Eden as he was there. Breathing in that breath of life like that. How wonderful. See, and then what does he say here? This is what's fascinating. All right, and, the, and, and it was the man, I'm just reading literally here for you. Uh, he, he, you know, he became a soul that was. Okay, as it translated, and a man became a living soul. But it's singular, chaya, not chayim. But why was Chaim breathed in there? Because there were two in there. Adam and Eve both were one. That's why you never see any place where God has to breathe into Eve's nostrils to give her the breath of life. She came filled with the Spirit of Almighty God. Just like in the beautiful type when Christ comes. Isn't it interesting? John from his own mother's womb was filled with the Holy Spirit, a type of the bride. And Christ come, and when he died on that cross there, and his side was thrust through, as the scripture says about him in Zechariah. And Zechariah 12, by the way, will be a compound fulfillment. I know that John identifies it as being fulfilled when Yeshua was crucified then, and they thrust his side through. But I'll tell you as well, it's a compound fulfillment because 2,000 years ago, they knew their tribal order. But Zechariah 12, we find out they don't know their tribal order. It says the house of Nathan would mourn apart with the house of David. That's, that's, the, that's the tribe of Judah. The house of Shemai and their families apart. That's the tribe of Benjamin. And of course, the Levites. And then all the families that remain gathered once again, just like when David crossed that river and came back. It was Shemai that spit on him on the way out, and it was Shemai that received him on the way back. I feel like a gospel jubilee right about now, guys. I tell you what. So I had to just share that with you, right? That water of life. See? And so Yeshua was put, see, Yeshua there, he was on the cross in that, just like Adam, in that deep sleep. And when his side was thrust through, what came forth? Blood and water, and the blood and water was separated. And yet in the temple, right there on the temple mount, and I know there's some that believe that's not the temple mount. If you go to the Hebrew Matthew, Shem Tobes Hebrew Matthew, Yeshua identifies the Roman fortress on the Mount of Olives. So it was there on the temple mount. Roddy Brown, precious brother, friend of mine there in Israel, He'll tell you, I've been with him under the ground, underneath the old city, and looked at the cisterns and everything there. I got pictures of it. How they forced that water there, and the water was much higher and would make the water come up up there on the Temple Mount with no problem. And they had that little side going out. As Rabbi Orley used to say, the temple was laid out like the human body, and the Holy of Holies is where the heart laid, and then that altar there where they kill those sacrifices on, and they use that water to wash the blood, and water would go out the side of the temple and down to the Kidron Valley. No wonder why the Messiah stood there and wept over Jerusalem right there on the Mount of Olives overlooking the Kidron Valley. But like Adam, 
Here he was. Now he was in that deep sleep. His side was opened up and his bride, that spirit of life was coming out. And then he's breathing on his bride like he did in the beginning. Like he took when that man also, when he took the blind man and he spit on the ground, he took the dust and he formed some clay and he put it on his eyes and told him to go wash there in the pool of Siloam. Why do you think he told him to wash in the pool of Siloam? It wasn't because of the water, the water, water of life was him. It was, his spit was that water of life. That's how he made that first man. Now, we go back to Moses. So we see Moses, what did he do? Moses was drawn from the water, got his name that way. Moses could turn the water to blood. Moses could take and part the waters. And now Moses took and he, he, he smote the rock because the rock would be judged. But there was one other thing, though, that had to happen. And it happened some, I believe they say, 38 years later, according to some sages. The book of Numbers chapter 20, we find out, and the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, came in the wilderness of Zen in the first month, and the people abode at Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there, and there was no water all over again, no water. And by the way, in Hebrew, that rock that they're going to speak about here in just a minute is Hatsur, the rock. Hmm... And what did God say about Syria and Damascus? You have forgotten the rock of your salvation. That's to the Christians that are supporting the Zionist movement for conquering in the Middle East. The giving of water is a water of life. It is not a water of conquering. You don't conquer people with water. It is to be a free gift of the Almighty. And there was no water for the congregation. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Just like they'll do with those two witnesses. And yeah, they'll be able to turn the water to blood as well. And people strove with Moses and spoke, saying, Would that we had perished when our brethren perished before the Lord? Why have you brought into the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness to die there? We and our cattle. And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or pomegranates. Neither is any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went into the presence of the assembly into the door in the tent of meeting and fell upon their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared in them. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, Take the rod and the assembly of the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. But Moses got lifted up in pride. And he got angry. And he smote the rock. Christ was to only be smitten once. Or does it mean that they will smite him again? Because the scripture does say that you crucify him afresh and put him to an open shame. Think about that, my Christian friends. Believers in Yeshua. With Noahide laws and every other kind of nonsense and, 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 and exalting man as Yeshua, as, as the scripture says, Yeshua says, another will come in his own name. Him you will receive. The true gift of God was Yeshua. Not another man. It's not Netanyahu and it's not Donald Trump. So he said to speak, he said, just go get them together and speak ye unto the rock. Kak et hama mate. Take, see, take, a, take your stick, your staff. And you go down there. So sad. And speak to that rock. Did it bring forth its water? And what, is it, what do you say? What do you say? And speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, that it give forth its water. The rock, by speaking, would give it. That is a prophecy. A prophecy. All you had to do is speak to it. What did John say when he wrote about Yeshua? See, what did the woman, look at the story. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Yeshua saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Yeshua answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, if you were to say that in Hebrew, 
אוקיי? אז את, אז את יודע הנתניהו And who it is that saith to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living waters. You see now, it's a prophecy. Numbers is a prophecy. Speak you unto the rock before their eyes, that it give forth its waters. Moses was to be an example for the Jews that when the Mashiach come, the rock of our salvation, just speak and ask him for the water. He'll give it to you. The woman said unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From where then has, have you this, this, that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Yeshua answered and said unto her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. If you drink of nothing else water, even if he was kind enough to not use it as a coercion, but would use it to draw the people, to draw the Arabic communities together, to want to love the Jewish nation, if he would do it the right way, it still would go out. But maybe that love would, would compel the Mashiach to come in our midst and our eyes could come open to who he really is. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into what? Everlasting life. What was the tree of life called? Eth Chaim. What is the waters of life? Chaim. The water that come from his side, that separated from his blood, showed that it was from his heart. And when he breathed on them, he was showing that he was the very God that breathed on Adam and created him. Made them male and female, created them. And now, and listen, my friends, I love you. I'm not here to, to bash President Trump. My desire is that he also would recognize these things. But the problem is, is you've surrounded him with the evangelical community. You've surrounded him with the, with the different rabbis of the Chabad organization. And the blind is leading the blind. That's the evangelicals leading the rabbis. Or the rabbis are leading the evangelicals. Whichever one it is. If the blind Yeshua says, which were the Pharisees, lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. And yet they have in here. And you know, Rick Wiles did a very marvelous video when he was talking about this recently. Uh, I forget exactly the date. Talking about where they compared Trump. The Trump-King David connection and how it connects with Abraham's covenant. Now here's what's interesting. When you read down in here, they connect Trump by using gematria. And Rick Wiles was on his program. He was really blasting it. He was calling it uh, sorcery. And I want to I want to prove a point here about this because they take in the article here and they kind of do this. Donald Trump in Gematria, Hebrew numerology equals 424, which is the same number as Moshiach bin David. Messiah from the house of David, in other words. Rabbi Berger pointed out. This certainly does not mean he will be the Messiah, but it indicates that he will play a role in preparing the way for the arrival of the Messiah. He clearly has this inclination. Why else would he have a campaign event overlooking the Temple Mount? No other president candidate, presidential candidate has done this. And he declared the temple, or excuse me, the, 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 to move the, the embassy to Jerusalem. All right, I'm not against the fact that we move the embassy to Jerusalem. It doesn't mean neither here nor there. But you miss the whole point about what's really going on in Jerusalem. The two-state solution is going to divide Jerusalem anyway. Makes no difference. All right? But the point is, they're using the gematria, and they're saying Donald Trump equals 424. Now, some of you might be into Kabbalah. You forget, I used to, I've been to Chabad. I've been to many synagogues in my life as a Jew. I have been there. I, have, I had a good friend of mine, a wonderful rabbi. I won't call his name here. Teaches Kabbalah. I went one time, said that I, I, I know what Kabbalah is. I have sat in the class before, and they get excited about it. 
but there's a divination to it as well. And let me show you how stupid it is to even use Gematria. All right, just to give you an example, all right? 424, all right? Trump's name equals out to 424. So I pulled up a chart just so you understand, all right? These are all, this is the Jewish Gematria, the words that equal 424. North Korea does. The word clay equals 424, all right? You can also have Skittles equals 424. You could have dollar collapses equal 424. You could have foot fetish, dancing queen. You could have burn in hell that equals 424. Are you going to take all these different words that equal 424 and apply that to Trump as well? Or is it like Piccadilly? It's just pick and choose what you want. You see, friends, look, President Trump is a man. And people have said he's given his life to Christ. That's between him and the Lord. But all I can tell you, he's a human being like anybody else, and he deserves a right to know the truth. And right now, there's a lot of people who have been leading him astray and leading him right to the ditch, right along with the rest. And my desire is that the president's eyes would open as well, just like I want to see the prime minister's eyes open as well. But the true gift of God is not President Trump, and it's not Prime Minister Netanyahu. The true gift of God is Yeshua. Yeshua answered and said unto her, and he answers and says unto any of us today, if you know the gift of God, if you knew, if you had the revelation of who the gift of God is, who the Mashiach really is, he is the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, give me to drink. You would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. I trust it will bless you in some way. And I want to pray for you now. I want to pray. Many of us, listen, I used to be hardcore Zionist. I never, I never was a Zionist of political Zionism. But I did stand with the state of Israel. I did stand unconditionally. And I had to repent as well. God forgive me for not recognizing with my own eyes and with my own revelation of God that to stand with the believers of Israel and to pray that their eyes will come open and to stand with the Palestinian believers and to stand with the Syrian believers and all the other believers that are being murdered through these senseless wars and pray that our people's eyes will come open because until their eyes come open, these wars will not end. Their eyes have to come open that Yeshua is the Mashiach. They not, not all will believe. But there will be a remnant that will believe. As Paul says in Romans 11, thus will, all, thus will all Israel be saved. That's not all Israel in the modern state of Israel. That is the remnant down through the last 2,000 years. Let's pray together. If you don't know Yeshua and you really want to know Him or you want that God will do something that will wake you up, you might be a Jewish believer or a Jewish man that doesn't know Yeshua or a woman. You might be an Arabic brother or sister out there listening and you, you believe that, uh, that Allah is the prophet. I'm telling you that Yeshua was the true. I know you believe Yeshua to be the prophet as well, but he was the Mashiach. He was the true Messiah. And there's no other one in between him and God except him. If you want to know him today, I'm going to pray with you right now. And I trust you will repent, confess your sins, give your life to him, and then be baptized in his name. That's my desire for you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are listening today. And I ask you, Father, Shoelet Orcha Abba. I ask you, Father, be Adonai. Please, Lord, hear my prayer for them that you will save everyone, that you will 
heal every broken heart, that you will cause the soul to thirst after the righteousness, to long for the living waters, and that the scales on their eyes will come off. I pray for my own people, Israel. I pray, Father God, that my people will recognize the truth of your word as well, regardless of what path they're on, that they would come out and recognize and stand for truth, though it be a hard way to go, that they'll stand for this. I ask it in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. Listen, guys, if you want truth like this, support this work. We need your help. And I just ask that humbly. You have our address at the bottom of the screen here, and we thank you for your love and your kindness. I would like to know if you something touched your heart today, you can email me, Stephen Venun, S-T-E-V-E-N-B-E-N-N-U-N at gmail.com. If you would, though, if you're writing me about God's tugging on your heart or you need to be prayed for, please put that pray, pray for me in the description or however God leads you on there. I, don't, I can't read all the emails, friends. I, I can't. I wished I could. If I did nothing but emails, I would never be able to do a single video in my life. I, there's just that many emails that come in. But I do want to try to reach out to those that are trying to contact us today. Thank you and God bless you. You can visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Thank you.